بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة وعبرة كل مؤمن ومؤمنة ما خاب والله من تمسك بكم وأمنا من لجأ إليكم سادتي يا ليتنا كنا معكم فنفوز معكم فوزا عظيما قال الله في محكم كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الذين يتلون كتاب الله وأقاموا الصلاة وأنفقوا مما رزقناهم سرا وعلانية سرا وعلانية يرجون تجارة لن تبور Sweeten and revive your gatherings with a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. The second for the love of our lady Fatima alayha salam. And for the love of Bab al Hawaij, Abil Fadl al Abbas, the third with the loudest of your voices. In 1902, Julian Slim Hilu migrated from his country to the country of Mexico at the age of 14. He left his country due to the demolition and conflicts that took over his country and killed the people of his country. He left and migrated from his country to the country of Mexico at the year 1902 at the age of 14. He worked hard day and night and strived to become someone who has a better future for himself and his for children and grandchildren better than what he had in his back and back in his home and back in his country before 1911 he purchased the first press and he started and established the first Arabic newspaper in the country of Mexico that earned him thousands and thousands of dollars. By 1911, he created the first company, the first Arab-made company in the country of Mexico called the Stars of the East. By 1921, his name became popular in the country of Mexico and he was known as Don Julian and worth $28 million. 70 years prior to that, the United States of America bought half of America from the country of Mexico for $70 million. Showing you how rich and wealthy this man became in mere years after his migration 
no different than you and I, my brothers and sisters, as immigrants in a country like the country of New Zealand that gives us opportunity and freedom to become wealthy entrepreneurs and tycoons and powerful individuals for ourselves and for our communities, for us to become stronger. An immigrant from the country of Lebanon, he leaves his country, he moves to the country of Mexico, and he becomes a Don in the country of Mexico. He also raised his children to also become entrepreneurs and to become businessmen. From an early age, he gave them a paper and a pencil, and he taught them the art of bookkeeping. How much money they earned, he would give them an allowance on daily basis, and every day he taught them to write how much money they made, and how much money they spent, how much they made by the month, by the week, and annually. He also taught them to invest in the stock market and he taught them how the stock exchange work and how the stock market worked. From an early age, before they became teenagers, he had already taught his children how to buy stocks and how to make profits from the stock market. At the year 1940, Carlos Hilu was born the son of Julian and now he is the second wealthiest man in the world having values and assets worth of 80 billion dollars buying all of Mexico's telecommunication companies and much much more a Middle Eastern immigrant brothers and sisters we don't all have to have poor jobs or accept the fact that we work from 8 to 5 and that is enough. These countries give us the opportunities and the opportunities reach the horizons. As much as you work and as, as hard as you work, you can strive to become a millionaire or a billionaire or a tycoon or even have your face on the front page of the Forbes magazines. If Islam wants Muslims to be on a magazine, if Islam wants you to be famous, Islam wants Muslims and believers to be on the front page of the, the Forbes magazine or the hundred top wealthiest men in the world or the most powerful men in this world. Islam does not want weak individuals or people who are poor. There is you know, a thought that Muslims should live a poor and modest life. They shouldn't earn a living. They shouldn't earn their wealth. This is not wrong. If Islam wants individuals to be placed on a magazine, Islam wants you to be on the front page of Forbes or the hundred wealthiest and powerful men around the world and around the globe. It wants the names of Ali, Muhammad, Hassan on the top. 100 individuals that make a difference in this world and in this planet. Islam does not want weak individuals who their calls and their shouts do not make a difference in any country or society or community. Islam wants individuals that their voices are heard and they play an impact within their communities, within their societies and within their countries. If we had a person like Carlos Slim Hulu in this country as a Muslim or anywhere around the world, we can influence the country's politics, the country's thought of what Muslims are truly are, educating Muslim others and non-Muslims of what Muslims are, that we are not all terrorists, we all we are not all evil individuals, but there are some of us, and most of us, and a majority of us who are kind-hearted. But without money and wealth and power, your word does not get through, brothers and sisters. Islam wants successful individuals. Islam wants us to earn a good living. Islam wants us to become powerful. Islam does want you to drive a nice car. Islam does want you to have a nice house. Islam wants the best for the people that follow its religion. 
Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi says, قام الإسلام على اثنين سيف علي ومال خديجة. Islam stood and became high. The words of Islam and the teachings of Islam became high and started to spread for two reasons and components. The Saif of Ali ibn Abi Talib, the sword of Ali ibn Abi Talib that defended Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi day and night as we recall in the battle of Badr when all the companions fled for their lives and for loot. Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam stood there and took every injury protecting Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. Rasulullah would tell him, Ya Ali, an yashumali. Amir al-Mu'mineen would rush to the left. Ya Ali, an yamini. And he would rush to the right and protect Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. Wa malu Khadija and the wealth of Khadija. If it was not for the wealth and the trade of Khadija, Islam would have never reached us today. We as Muslims would not have been sitting here. We have probably been on different religions and different paths than the path of Allah and His beloved Prophet Muhammad. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Historians say that the trade of Khadija used to be a thousand camels. Her trade annually would be a thousand camels. She would take a thousand camels of load of wealth and bring back a thousand camels worth of goods and products to sell amongst the Arabians and in the per Arabian Peninsula. She was one of the wealthiest people and indiv individuals in the city of Mecca and within the whole Arabian Peninsula. You don't have to be a man to become wealthy. Even women, if they work hard and strive in communities like this, or even in Muslim communities, they can also become wealthy as strong individuals that can play an impact on the lives of their sisters and their mothers. They can help their mothers and sisters build community centers, help them. And same thing with the brothers. Khadija alayha afwal salatu wa salam gave everything to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to a point that when she passed away, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi used his aba as a shrap for our mother Khadija. She did not even own a kafan and a shroud because she gave everything in the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the sake of this religion. So Islam doesn't want poor individuals. He doesn't want weak individuals earning a minimum wage. No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants every single person in this room having a big bank account with at least six zeros so we can contribute to this community and contribute to our beliefs and contribute to the religion of Islam. If you don't have anything, you have nothing to offer. If you don't work hard, you have nothing to offer. When the box comes around for you to make a donation, you have nothing to offer. When there are donations for the masjid, for the masjid to expand and the Husayniya to expand, you have nothing to offer. All the opportunities pass you. A person with wealth, he can take those opportunities before they pass. As the clouds pass, as the Imam says, الفرص تمر كمر السحاب. Your chances and opportunities in this dunya to prepare for the akhirah pass as the clouds pass. When I'm sitting in the hotel and preparing, I have the, the blinds open and I see every second there is a cloud passing by. That's how fast opportunities pass us in this life. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says, Ni'mal awn ala taqwa al ghina. The best of fortunes that we can have and the best of age that we could have for our akhira and our taqwa and our piety and our belief is wealth. Is wealth. When you can 
give to the community, when you can protect yourself from poverty because as Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam says, poverty, if, I, if poverty was a man, I would have beheaded him and I would have killed him because poverty brings kufr and unbelieving and the man of, in the heart of man. So if a man is wealthy and he strives to this dunya, he works hard, he also has the opportunity to build for his akhirah. He also has the opportunity to build for his akhirah. Every time someone comes and asks him who is in need, he can give them. Every time the mosque or the masjid or the Husseiniyah is in need, he could give them and he could make contributions and people will praise him for that. But if a person cannot contribute, he will never be praised in the community. A person who donates 100,000, 200,000, a million dollars to his brothers, his sisters, and his Muslim community, he will be praised. Everyone will be talking about him. May Allah bless him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enlighten his path. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless his family. Another hadith by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi says, Ni'mal aun ala al akhira ad dunya. The best of aids for your akhira is this dunya. By growing strong and powerful and wealthy in this dunya, you can help yourself in the hereafter. But if you do not have anything and you're empty handed, you cannot contribute for yourself or for your community or for the good of man. But if a person has the wealth to give, the assets to give, then you will be in the position of praise. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi afdhalu salatu wa salam in the Holy Quran. He says, إِنَّمَا وَلِيُّكُمُ اللَّهَ وَإِنَّ وَلِيُّكُمُ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا الَّذِينَ يُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةَ وَيَأْتُونَ الزَّكَاةَ وَهُمْ رَاكِعُونَ Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam is mentioned in the Quran. Why? Because he gave his ring in his salah and his prayers. If he did not own a ring like the rest of the Muslims, and if he did not work hard to have a ring that had some value, some economical value, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not have mentioned him. But with his full heart, when that man entered the masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and he begged for someone to help him, and he asked the Muslims to help him, and none of them had anything to offer either out of jealousy or because of poverty. Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi afdal salati wa salam is in his ruku' he takes off his ring and he gives it to this man and this man goes and sells this ring and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes the act of Amir al-Mu'mineen eternal. That you and I every time we read the Holy Quran, we read the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we see that Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi afdal salati wa salam became eternal by giving. Another ayah, speaking of the virtues of Ahlul Bayt, إِنَّمَا نُطْعِمُكُمْ لِوَجْهِ اللَّهِ لَا نُرِيدُ مِنْكُمْ جَزَاءً وَلَا شَكُورًا When Ahlul Bayt gathered, when Amir al-Mu'mineen, Imam al-Hasan and Imam al-Hussein, alayhum afwal al-salati was salam, were mentioned in the Qur'an because of their sacrifice and because of their giving, because they had to give. Imam al-Hassan and Imam al-Hussein become very ill. So Amir al-Mu'mineen and Fatima, peace be upon her, make an oath to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Oh Allah, if you give our children healing, we will fast for three consecutive days. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestows them healing and shifa. They fast for three days, the, mothers and the, uh, the mother and the father. But Imam al-Hasan and Imam al-Hussein, they say, we want to fast as well. So they start to fast the first day. Fatima alayha afwala salatu was salam goes and bakes a piece of bread for the family. That's all they have. The door is knocked as soon as they want to break their fast. And there is an orphan at the door saying, who will feed me? I am an orphan. 
If they did not have that piece of bread to give, their life and their teachings would have not been eternal or praised by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and praised by you and I. So they give him the piece of bread. The second day, a asir comes by, a captive, and also asks to be fed. A third day, Ibn al-Sabil, a passenger through the city of Medina, by the third day when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alih enters the house of Amir al-Bu'mineen and Fatima alayhi salam he sees Imam al-Hasan, Imam al-Hussein shaking from hunger. And that is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descended these words, these eternal words. إِنَّمَا نُطْعِمُكُمْ لِوَجْهِ اللَّهِ لَا نُرِيدُ مِنْكُمْ جَزَاءً وَلَا شَكُورًا we gave you and fed you just for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not so you can thank us or appreciate our acts. But if they did not have anything to give, brothers and sisters, if you don't have anything to give, then you are not in the position to be praised by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or His creatures and the sons of Adam. A person like Warren Buffett can donate 2.1 billion dollars because he has the money. He has the money. Do you know how many schools, how many orphanages? 2.1 billion dollars can build. How many poor and needy people it could shelter and house? Why is it that Warren Buffett is the only person that could give such money? Why don't we have Shia Muslims and Shia brothers and sisters who can make the same contributions to their societies, to their people, to this world and be praised by people and be praised by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You could build so many schools with 2.1 billion dollars. In a country like Afghanistan, Pakistan, or India, it costs thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars to build a school. The best school that these kids ever imagine or wish for. Imagine building a hundred schools, a thousand schools, a thousand orphanages, hospitals in countries that do not have the means to go and heal themselves and have the proper medication. Every single person who is educated in that school, you earn the thawab. Every time an orphan eats from your wealth, you take that thawab. Every time a person goes to that hospital that you built, you earn that thawab and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises you. So do the people. Imam al-Sadiq alayhi afdal salati wa salam says, أمير المؤمنين عليه أفضل الصلاة والسلام أعتق ألف مملوك من كد يديه. Some people think that أهل البيت أمير المؤمنين and the household of رسول الله they were poor individuals. Please, if your children are crying, take them upstairs. صلى على محمد وآل محمد. Some people think that Ahlul Bayt, they were poor individuals. They didn't have money. So that's why they had to live such a simple life. But this is not true, brothers and sisters. Imam al Sadiq says that Amir al Mu'mineen freed a thousand slaves with his hard work and him working in the vineyards of the city of Medina and his commerce and his hard work, he freed a thousand slaves. Amir al Mu'mineen would even work in the vineyards of the Christians and the Jews. We have heard the stories of how Amir al Mu'mineen used to work for a Jewish man, for a Christian man, so he can earn a righteous income, halal income for himself and his family, and for him to aid himself on the akhirah, on the day of judgment. So he frees a thousand slaves. He had dug wells and he owned the most wells in the city of Medina to a point that all the vineyards of the city of Medina, they would be watered 
by the walls of Amir al-Mu'mineen and he had placed this means of irrigation to the people of Medina and the vineyards of Medina, the trees of Medina through him. He had worked hard and through that money that he earned, he would free slaves, he would feed people. If he chose to wear one shirt, that's a different case for him to live equal to every single people of his country. So they do not say our king wears more luxurious clothes or has a better life. And of course, as an imam and as a ma'soom, he has to live amongst the people, with the people. But Amir al-Mu'mineen was not a poor man. Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam was not a poor man. A man comes to Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam and he tells him that I am poor. Imam al-Hasan does not even tell him how much you need or ask him how much you need. He tells him to write what he needs on the ground just in case that this man becomes shy to ask from Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam. This man writes 10,000 golden dinars. Imam al-Hasan goes into his house and he comes out with 10,000 golden dinars, enough for this man to survive off of and his children and grandchildren to survive off of for the rest of their lives. Imam al-Hasan was not poor. Amir al-Mu'mineen was not poor. Musa ibn Ja'far alayhi salam was known for his generosity. The people of Baghdad used to speak about the surrat Musa. The pack, the pack of Musa ibn Ja'far. He would give the believers, the mu'mins, the Shia and the non-believers, even those who were nasabi and sh publicly showed their hatred towards Ahl al-Bayt. Historians say that the neighbor of Musa ibn Ja'far alayhi salam used to be a nasabi. Every day he would curse Amir al-Mu'mineen, Fatima and the household of Rasulullah. But Musa ibn Ja'far would never show him illness or talk back to him. One day, Musa ibn Ja'far is walking through the vineyard. This man starts to curse. He starts to curse at Musa ibn Ja'far, the son of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Musa ibn Ja'far alayhi afdal salati wa salam. He goes and tells him what is wrong, what upset you? He told him, you stepped on my crop. Musa ibn Ja'far alayhi salam tells him, well, how much do you earn per crop annually? He tells him, how do I know? I don't know the ilm al ghaib I don't know the foreseen. He tells him, well, last year, how much did you make? tells him, I made 2,000 golden dinars. Musa ibn Ja'far goes into his home and he comes out with 4,000 golden dinars. He tells him, this is for this year's crop and this 2,000, extra 2,000 is for next year and for you to earn a better living. This man turns and he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows where to place his rasala and where to place his message. If Musa ibn Ja'far did not have money to give, if Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam did not have money to give, these people would not have believed in him. This man says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala surely knows where to place his message because these people do, are not stingy and not greedy and they give everything they own. So you and I can believe in the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam two times in his lifetime gave everything away to the people, to the mu'mineen, everything that he owned, sold his house, sold everything and he gave it to the poor and the needy of the Shia and the Muslims. So if they did not have, we should not say that the Imams did not have, this is why they lived such a simple life. No, the Imams had. The Imams were entrepreneurs like their grandfather Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, who was an entrepreneur and a businessman from an early age. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi started his first trade with his uncle Abu Talib alayhi salam, he was a teenager, he was 13, 14 years old. Abu Talib takes him to Damascus 
Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ala proves his business skills and he brings a great fortune to Abu Talib. And this is one of the reasons that Khadija alayhi salam became interested in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ala. One for his skills in business as an entrepreneur and the second his amana because he was Muhammad al Amin, he was the trustworthy. These were the characteristics that drove Khadija towards Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So, so this religion, the religion of Islam, it does not want people to just accept the fact that they have a simple job. Islam wants us, every single one of us, to become wealthy and to become powerful. Every single one of us. Thus, Islam says that it is not enough for you to have just a normal job. For you to go earn a degree, become an engineer or a physician or a psychologist, and that's enough. You get $60,000 a year, $70,000 a year, and sit there and that's it, do nothing else. Islam advocates every single one of us to go work for our money, to stand in a store, to go and work. Imam al-Sadiq alayhi afwal al-salati wa salam says, Tis'atu a'ashar al-rizq fi tijara So if you're a doctor making $200,000, $300,000 a year, you're only making 10% of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written for you as sustenance. The other 90% is in you going and working hard day and night starting a business, become an entrepreneur, investing. And that's how you earned every single penny and every single dollar that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written in your name. Also, Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam says, The person who goes and works hard for his family is no different than the man who stands in the middle of a battleground. He is no different than a soldier. So if your husbands are leaving five in the morning and going to earn a living for you and your children, treat them like a warrior, treat them like a soldier, as if you will never see them again, kiss them farewell. Show them respect, just like if you will never see your husbands again. How much love you would show him and respect you would show him. Show him that same respect when he is leaving at 5 a.m. or 4 a.m. Some fathers and some parents leave their homes so they can feed their children. Islam says that this person is no different than a mujahid fighting between swords and spears and bullets and bombs. That he has the same respect and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him the same value. So we need to work. We need to work with our hands. We need to work with our brains. We need to work with all of our existence. With all of our existence. A person like Nabiullah Dawood, peace be upon him and upon our beloved Prophet, because he did not have a job. And he did not have a trade. He cried to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for 40 nights. Oh Allah, give me some knowledge or teach me something that I could earn a living with. And that is how Prophet Dawood alayhi salam became a blacksmith. And he was mentioned in the Quran for making the best armor and hadid and steel became like clay in his hands and he would make the best of weaponry. We as men and women also have to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, Oh Allah, show us the way. How do I start a business? I want to work hard day and night. Oh Allah, show me how I can work hard day and night and gain more so I can give more to my community. I could give to my brothers and sisters and I can prepare for my akhirah and live a more comfortable life in this dunya. 
Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam says, Inni uhibbu an yata'adha al-rajul biharr al-shams bitalab al-ma'isha. That he wants to say, every single one of us see hardship under the scorching sun earning a living. Go out there, get what you need to get, work hard. Imam al-Sadiq wants you to see, see you struggle, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to see you struggle to earn his sustenance and earn his pleasure. Don't be lazy, don't always take the easy route. If you have, you know, a bookkeeping job that you just go and sit behind a computer and it, you are not spending any, any energy for five, six, seven, or eight hours after that. Don't just go home, find another job and work hard and strive in this dunya. Work hard, see some hardship in this dunya. This is what Imam al-Sadiq wants to see and this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to see. A man comes to Imam al-Sadiq trying to find him he finds him in one of his vineyards. He's not sitting in his house between his books, between his servants and peasants. Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam is in his vineyard, plowing his vineyard. He is sweating. And then when he is asked why, oh, the son of Rasulullah, why are you doing this work? There are people that could help you. There are Shia that would die to help you and plow your vineyards. He says, well, I want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to see me that I am working myself to earn a halal income and to earn his sustenance. I want to feed myself. I don't want to depend on other individuals. And to come to this subject, many of our Muslim brothers in this country are dependent on this government. Why are you depending on them? Why are you depending on them? Why don't you go work? And this land, the land of opportunity, you can have a job, you can work as hard as you can to earn a living. What's the difference between sitting on a sidewalk and begging or sitting at home and begging from this government? There is no difference. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want the Shia and the followers of Imam Hussein to go through such humilities because you know what the, the things that they think? They think, why is it that this Iraqi, this Iranian, this Afghani comes here, he sleeps in his house, he's just eating and sleeping and reproducing while me, the Kiwi or the people of New Zealand, the natives, we have to go work hard day and night. Where is the justice? And these are the reasons why they start to hate Muslims, hate you and I, brothers and sisters. This is why they point their fingers at us and say, go back to your country. Once you start providing for this country, working hard for this country, and working hard for yourself, this is when we are accepted in these foreign lands. This is when they will show us respect and respect will be given to us. Salla ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. A family of six brothers come to Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. They come to Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam and they tell him, Ya Aba Abdullah, we have a brother that spends all his time in worship and in salah and in fasting. He doesn't come and work, he doesn't do anything. He's just in his house. He just prays, he fasts, he doesn't do anything. From the morning that he wakes up, he's on salah, he's fasting. Till night, 24 hours a day, through his whole lifetime. Imam al-Sadiq says, and who provides for him or his family? They say, we do. We provide for him and his family. Imam al-Sadiq says, Wallah, lilladhi yaqootu ashaddu ibadatin min. Wallah, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those people who are giving him his sustenance are more in worship and greater worshipers than he is. He's not a worshiper. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want you to be on your sujada making tasbih and praying 24 hours a day or fasting throughout the year. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to go and earn a living.
بر محمد و آل محمد صلوات Now, is there a trade that we can make with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is there a commerce that we can have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? We can make commerce in this world, trade with this world, for we gain benefits, we gain wealth. Is there a way we can trade with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a way of trade and commerce with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So we seek His pleasure and our eternal happiness in the dun in the akhirah allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the holy quran says ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu hal adullukum ala tijaratin baynakum tunjikum min adhabin alim oh the sons of adam O oh, believers do you want me to direct you towards a commerce and a business and a trade that pushes the fierce punishments of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you live a lavish eternal life and a comfortable eternal life. تُؤْمِنُونَ بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَتُجَاهِدُونَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ بِأَمْوَالِكُمْ وَأَنفُسِكُمْ دَالِكُمْ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ That, O oh believers, first believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger, the teachings of His Messengers, and then Make jihad, not jihad with your sword. Tujahiduna fi sabil Allahi bi amwalikum. Make jihad towards Allah subhanahu wa taala and strive towards Allah subhanahu wa taala with your wealth, with your money. Give to Allah subhanahu wa taala. Don't become stingy. Open your hands. Don't always have them closed. This is the way you can survive on the day of judgment and be praised in this dunya. Tujahiduna fi sabil Allahi bi amwalikum. Build a masjid. Build a school for your children. Provide for them. So many times we go into communities. We know that there are brothers in deep loans, in deep pressure when his neighbor or his friend has so much money in the bank account. He doesn't even bother himself to call him up. Do you need some help? Can I help you with some, some money? Can I give you $1,000, $10,000, $100,000? We know that there are people in the community that these numbers mean nothing to them. But to some, it's either their house becomes foreclosed, foreclosed and they lose their homes and they don't have a house or else someone comes and helps them. He has five or six kids, he's living in a two bedroom. When I have, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed me with a lot of wealth. I can go and help him buy a bigger house for him and his children to be comfortable. Fatima alayha afwala salatu wa salam. We just, we, we as Shia brothers and sisters, do we just remember the stories and the traditions of Ahl Bayt and do nothing about it? We're just there to say, MashaAllah, SubhanAllah, and not input them in our lives. Not input them in our lives. We mention these stories and these stories were written down so we can place them in our lives and we could live by them. And we could live by them. A man comes to the Masjid of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he asks for help. He doesn't even have enough clothes. He's just covering his aura, his privates. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi tells him to go towards the house of Fatima, his daughter, and at his house, the house of Fatima alayhi salam, they will help him. He leaves the masjid because no one helped him. He goes towards the house of Fatima alayhi afwal salati wa salam, and he tells her, Ya bint Rasulullah, O oh, the daughter of Rasulullah, your father sent me to your house for you to help me. I don't have any clothes and I don't have anything to eat. First Fatima alayha afwala salati was salam goes and carries the only blanket that they had in their house. And she goes and gives it to him. He says, well, this is not enough for me. 
You clothe me, I will still die of hunger. I will still be hungry. Fatima alayhi salam had dependence given to her by her cousin, the daughter of Hamza. Asadullah wa asad rasulih. By the daughter of Hamza, the lion of God, the only pendants that she had by her cousin. Imagine how much she valued this pendant. Imagine having the only jewelry that you have. How many people are willing to give their only golden ring or their only earrings? How much precious they would be. Fatima alayhi salam takes off her pendant and she give the, gives it to this man. This man rushes towards the masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and he calls upon the Muslims that, O oh Muslims, I have the pendant of the daughter of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And how much will you pay for the pendant of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi? Maytham runs towards him, Maytham at Tamara, and he says, I give you a thousand camels just for you to give me this pendant one day, and then we return it to the daughter of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. That one thing that she gave, that one pendant that she gave, changed that man's life. Changed that man's life, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saw her sincerity. To give what's most precious to you, the most precious thing that you have in life, to give it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why when millions of visitors go to the city of Karbala, they don't just visit the grave of Imam Hussein. They go walk 300 meters towards the other side and they visit his brother Abil Fadl al Abbas because he gave the most precious thing in life. When he sat in the river bank and he held the water in his hand and he was thirsty. And he threw the water back when he remembered the household of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saw his act. Saw his act. How noble of an act that was. And that is why every single beloved, lover of Ahlul Bayt alayhum afwal salati wa salam. When they remember Imam al Hussein, they remember Abil Fadl al Abbas. Because he gave the most precious thing to himself at that time, in the time where it was heated, it was he was thirsty, he was under agony, he was under stress, he was fighting enemies, and he had not drank water within days. But he threw the water down, and he told himself, "Hey, hot, hey, hot! There is no way that I can drink this cold water and." The heat is burning the heart of my master, Hussein. On the 10th of Muharram, Imam Hussein's army had fallen. All his companions, all his children, all the children of Aqil, all the, Mus all the children of his brothers had also fallen. Now there were only two men standing outside the tents of the ladies and the daughters of Rasulullah. It was only Imam Hussein and Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas came to Imam Hussein after hearing the cries of the daughters of Rasulullah. He came and told him, Ya Mawla, Ya Aba Abdullah, I can no longer take the tears of the children. I can no longer witness the enemies of Allah come and attack every single member of the household of Rasulullah. <coughs> Give me permission to go and fight. Imam Hussein turns to him, he tells him, Ya Aba Al-Fadl, if you go and fight, I will no longer have a protector. I will no longer have an army and my enemies will rejoice. Ya Abu al if you go and leave us alone, who will be there for Zainab and the daughters of Rasulullah? But if you insist, my brothers, then go and bring water for the children, for my daughters and my infant. 
cannot breathe, they are dying of thirst. Abel Fadl al Abbas mounts his horse. He rides towards the river of Farat. He pushes the enemies of Allah from the river bank. He places his hand in the water. He drops the water and says, Ya nafsu min ba'dil Hussein huni. Oh my nafs, remember Hussein, that without Hussein you would have never existed. He mounts his horse. He fills the water jug and he starts to ride towards the battle camp, towards Sukaina, towards Ruqayya, towards Abdullah al -Radhi. He starts to ride towards the camp until one of the enemies of Allah comes and hits him on his right arm. His right arm falls to the ground. He starts to say, Wallahi in qata'atumu yameeni. Oh Allah, you have taken my right arm, but I will still protect the household of Rasulullah. The flag is still up. The flag of the flag bearer of Hussein is still up. Brothers and sisters, imagine now Zainab is standing outside the tent. Sukaina, Ruqayya, all the women are outside the tent. They see the flag of Abil Fadl. And another man comes and he hits Abel Fadl al Abbas on his left arm. His, fall, his arm falls to the ground. They see the flag of the flag bearer fall to the ground. Abel Fadl al Abbas holds the water jug in his mouth. Harmala comes out of nowhere. He shoots an arrow at the water jug. The water is pierced, it falls to the ground. Abil Fadl al Abbas now stands in the middle of the battleground with no arms to protect himself and no water for the children. He stands there, he doesn't know what to do. Should I go back towards the river or should I go back towards the children of Hussein? At that same moment, an arrow comes piercing through his eyes. Abil Fadl al Abbas can no longer see or protect himself. A man comes from behind carrying a huge metal rod. It's Abil Fadl al Abbas on his head. Ima al Abbas falls from his horse. This is the first time he calls upon his brother. Ya Akha, Adrik Akha. Oh, my brother rushed to me. I have fallen. My historians say that at that moment, Abil Fadl al Abbas was kicking. He was scared. He wanted to see Imam Hussein one last time before he departed from this world. He hears footsteps by his ears. He tells him, Ya Fulan. I, I, I ask you by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to let me live until I see my brother Hussein. <laughs> Imam Hussein with a broken heart tells him, Ya Abel Fad, this is your brother Hussein. <laughs> Imam Hussein sits at the ground. He brings the head of Abil Fadl in his lap. He's looking at his little brother, at his younger brother. This is what happened to my brother. This is what happened to Qamar al Ashira. He puts his head in, in his lap. Al Abbas removes his head, he throws it back to the ground. Another time, Imam Hussein places his head in his lap. He throws his head back at the ground. Imam Hussein tells him, Ya Abel Fadl, why is it that you're removing your head from my lap? Don't you want your head to be in my lap at the farewell? He tells him, No, oh Abel Fadl, oh Imam Hussein, I want my head to be on the ground because there will no, not be a person to hold your head when you are alone, when you have fallen from your horse. Then Imam Hussein tells him, Ya Abel Fadl, let me carry you back to the tents. Let me carry you back to the tents. Imam Abel Fadl tells him, Oh my brother, Ya Ba Abdullah, 
Is this how you want to take me back towards Zainab? Is this how you want Rabab to see me? Is this how you want your children to see me? He tells him, let me be in my place. Keep me here. Imam Hussein stands up and says, Al-an inkasara dhari, Al-an qallat hilati, Al-an shabta bi aduwi. Now my back has been broken. Now my enemies are celebrating. Imam Hussein holds his back, walks towards back, towards the camp. The women are waiting, the children are waiting. Oh, oh Imam Hussein, where is Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas? Where is Qamar al-Ashira? Is he still getting water? Where is he? Imam Hussein, without an answer, he goes in the tent of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas and he pushes the tent. The tent collapses. All the women start to scream and weep. Wa 